I was given the topic of talking about treatment and prevention. And I really sort of got a chuckle out of the prevention part because, boy, that's like, mm, that's a, you, you get a Nobel Prize for that. And I thought, well, I don't think I'm going to get a Nobel Prize, but I'll see what I can do. And so here's the thing for prevention. You need to have had parents from Asia or from African-American background. You needed to have been the last in your class to start your period. So if you were 14, 15, 16 and thought it was never going to happen, that's a good thing. You needed to have a child within a year of starting your periods. And you need to sort of look like Twiggy. So I think we have probably all missed the boat on that. Uh, so now you're like everybody else. And I did not spend, uh, put much in here about breast cancer for men. Statistically, one in 200 cancers, the breast in the United States will be men. In my tw soon to be 29 years, uh, I have two. And that is well below the 0.5%. So I'm gonna really talk about the ladies because that's where most of the money is and where most of the problems rise. Talking about prevention, I went to a talk Last week, for myself, from one of the folks who used to be at Sloan Kettering in New York, big cancer research thing, and there's been talk about diet being the source of cancers for everything. Some of you may remember when saccharin was a bad thing. Some of you remember was when coffee was a bad thing for pancreatic cancer. And doctors spend a lot of time and write a lot of papers about various things that you should and shouldn't do. We're very good about telling you that. The bottom line is there's really nothing etched in stone about things you can avoid. Maybe a little bit for high fat diets, but because obesity is a big link for breast cancer, it's hard to separate out the fats from being fat. And the reason obesity is a part of the problem is that estrogen is stored in fat tissue. So if a woman is of age where she, her ovaries are active, estrogen secreted into the bloodstream, the, from there it goes into the fat and it's deposited, sort of like money in the bank. When a woman normally goes through menopause and her ovaries stop working, the bank account is slowly withdrawn. So there's more estrogen in the woman's system who is obese than a woman who is thin. And there's certainly a link between length of exposure to estrogen, it gets back to that issue if you were last in your class, that's a good thing. And that may be the link of why high fat diets are bad. Estrogen exposure from whenever you started your period, which we finally call menarche to menopause, it can run anywhere between usually around age 10 to 13. My daughter crossed over to the dark side at age nine. It was a very long time until she went away till college. Menopause, typically 35 to 55, more commonly in the 45 to 55 age bracket. And during that time, it's natural and normal for a woman to have estrogen in her body. Before that and after that, not so much. Exogenous estrogens, that means pills, creams, salves, potions, and lotions that are used after menopause extend the exposure. And that may be, again, some link to why some women are more likely to get uh, breast cancers because they've had a longer exposure. And one of the things I hear and see a lot is that somebody said, I took estrogens and that's why I got breast cancer. Not really, estrogen doesn't cause breast cancer, but it certainly can facilitate it. And the difference is, and the example I use with the folks I see, is that if you have bare ground and sunlight hits it, something's gonna grow. Even in Caswell County, something will grow. It's usually weeds. Now, did the sunshine make the weeds or did it allow the seeds in the soil to grow. It was seeds in the soil. And for everybody who has landscaping projects at home, what is the biggest thing we sell in North Carolina? Pine needles and hard, hardwood mulch. Why do we put that down? So the sunlight doesn't reach the soil and we don't have to pick all the weeds. So estrogen may be a facilitator, it's not a cause. Let's see here, where are we at? Estrogens, they, they can be a love-hate relationship. People don't typically like having menstrual periods, but boy, when they go through menopause, some people have a stormy time. Um, 
my only carry home message for those who are thinking, well, should I keep taking them or should I get off? Unless you're at a stage where you're trying to get your bones built up for osteoporosis prevention, if you don't absolutely need them, it's probably a happier time without them. Getting back to prevention, chemo prevention is taking a drug to try to prevent something bad from happening. Birth control pills are a good example. Chemo prevention of pregnancy. We don't want some, somebody doesn't want to be pregnant, they take a birth control pill to suppress ovulation so they aren't releasing eggs so they don't get pregnant. Chemo prevention for breast cancer is to try to suppress the effects of estrogen on the body. It's covering, it's the mulch I was talking about before, so that the estrogen is still in the body, but the medication prevents the body parts that would respond to it from seeing the estrogen. There are two, tamoxifen and Avista. Tamoxifen is $4 a month, Avista is $150 a month. Tamoxifen's been around for 30 years, Avista hasn't. They both will reduce the risk of cancer about 50%. And we were just hearing about the coupons that you can get and get 25% off. Well, what if those coupons got you 50% off? That would be a great thing. The question is, 50% off what? It's not an absolute reduction in the sense that 50% or 100% of women are gonna get breast cancer. Only a small percentage of women are gonna get breast cancer. That doesn't prevent everybody from not being concerned about it. Even the Cancer Society says that one in eight women is gonna get breast cancer. And I'm sure you've heard that number a number of times, and boy, it's a scary figure. You know, you look around the room, you see that, um, hmm, who is it that's gonna have it? But I have to admit, I think the Cancer Society plays a little bit loose with the data. They include people living up until age 85. Life expectancy for white women in the United States is 81. So if you add four years in the highest risk age group, you know, the older you get, the more likely you're gonna get something bad. We don't die from pneumonia anymore. We aren't dying from whooping cough. We're gonna die from heart disease and cancer. So those are the things that come with age. So if you add years on at the end, you're gonna skew the data. But the reality is, is that age 35, the chance of developing a cancer over the next 20 years is only two and a half percent. Now, if you're in that 2.5% group, that's a concern, but reducing the risk only goes down 1%. It's really almost 1 in 100. And like everything that in the healthcare, even if it's not cost, there are side effects. Age 50, the risk over the next 25 years, only 5%. 65, it's 5.5%. Five so chemo prevention for the general population is not advocated. The benefits are not outweighed by the risks. For people who have some high risk characteristics, be it in family history or previous biopsies, it's a different story, but there's really no good chemo prevention for breast cancer at this time. Getting into the side effects, they have to be the decision to use the medication is one that really takes a, an informed decision with your doctor. There are all sorts of tools we use to try to figure out who's who and who's gonna benefit. But the vast majority of people who are gonna get breast cancer, it's not gonna be because their mother had it or their sister had it or they, they have an abnormal genetic code. They were standing in the wrong place at the wrong time. Now, detection. Physical exam by the patient or provider. American Cancer Society is not really pounding on women to check themselves anymore. I'm not quite sure the rationale behind that. I think it's a reasonable thing to do for women who take the time to get good at it. They can give themselves a reasonably good exam. And there's no doubt that I've had a lot of folks who found their own tumors. And if they had depended on the yearly or every other year mammogram, or their gynecologist, family doc, PA, whoever they see, it might have had a little bit more time to percolate in there. And if you don't like checking yourselves, you should always think about subcontracting the work. <laughs> now, personally, my only reason that you shouldn't check is that you don't, have, you don't have breasts or you don't have fingers. Now, misconceptions, and this is what I get. I, oh, every time I check, I feel all sorts of lumps. And I think that's from people starting with the idea that the breast is a bowl of butterscotch pudding, perfectly soft and smooth, and that they're not feeling that. 
they're not feeling that anywhere. And therefore, they are just not going to look. But the breast is a gland. And for those of you who remember getting strep throat as children, big swollen glands, it is made up of nooks and crannies. And in all honesty, the structure is far more like grapefruit. You wouldn't think to be a grapefruit to be soft and smooth. It's got sections to it. I describe it more like a bowl of warm rice pudding. There's a granularity or you're going to feel stuff. And people go, oh, I feel stuff. I don't, I don't know what I'm feeling. You don't have to know what you're feeling. What you're looking for is change. If everything felt warm rice pudding and then all of a sudden somebody threw a hazelnut in there, you'd go, I don't know what it is, but it wasn't there before. And then you've done your job. Some women get comfort from doing that, and a lot of people do the punches pilot. It's not my, I'm going to let somebody else do it. For those who are checking, things I asked, things that are new. If it wasn't there before, it probably shouldn't be there. Doesn't mean that it's bad, but it needs to be checked. And the contour of the breast is something that it's important to look at. And I'm amazed that women don't look at their breast. If one headlight all of a sudden is pointing off this way and the other one straight ahead, there's something going on. You need to tell somebody about that. If both breasts are pointing normally this way and all of a sudden one's veering up, and I just had this happen three weeks ago. A woman came in and said, my, my, this breast is, is it's riding higher. It, 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 it feels different. And she was absolutely right. It was different and not in a good way. Discharge, real common. Folks come in. Most of the time it's because of stimulation. And I'll leave it to your imagination what that stimulation might be. It's rarely cancer, but if it's new, it should be looked at. Pain is a driving factor. I can think back of two people that have presented in the last 28 years who had pain. So pain is typically not cancer, but if it's there and it doesn't go away, it's a reason to raise your hand and say, take a look. <clears throat> when to check. For those ladies before menopause, please don't check the week before your period. Nobody has the time to look at all the things that are going to go be gone in a week. You want to check the week after your period because that's when the breasts are smallest, softest, and least lumpy. Things that come and go, sort of like relatives, you can't do much about them. Mm -hmm. Things that come and stay, that's a whole different picture. After menopause, pick a time, put it on the calendar, and do it once a month. I loved asking people, do you check yourself? Oh yes, how often? The ceiling look. It's like when I go to the dentist and they ask, do you floss? Yes, I do. I flossed this morning. <laughs> and when did you floss before that? Well, when was I here last? <laughs> so if you do it every month, you get in the habit of it, it gets less scary, and you're gonna be more confident in your exam, and you're not gonna be worried about raising your hand and afraid somebody's gonna laugh at you, because nobody's gonna laugh at you if you come in and you find out that it's nothing. Much rather have that than the other way around. Talking a little bit about the breast, for the older ladies who have gone through menopause and not taking hormones, the breast is, gets much easier to check as the milk-making machinery is taken down and replaced with that dreaded F word, fat. But it's easier to check. And also mammograms get better as you get older because of the fat. Menopause and hormones, your breasts, any woman's breasts are not the sharpest tool in the shed. They don't know where the hormones are coming from. They just know that they're there and it makes them feel young. And you're going to have more lumps and bumps and tenderness if you're taking continuous amounts of hormones. Now back to detection. What can we do besides a physical exam? Mammograms, ultrasound, and MRI. I suspect most of the people in this room have had a chance to be flattened by the, MRI, by the uh, mammogram machine. Um, it's the gold standard for women over 40. Ultrasound's used for the women under 30 because the breasts are typically so dense, there's so much tissue, the mammogram has trouble sorting the wheat from the chaff. Ultrasound's used for the younger, younger crowd supplemented with mammograms. MRIs are used rarely. Several reasons. Number one, they're $3,000, $3,500. They take a long time. They take a long time to read. And they will frequently show you lots of stuff that you didn't need to know about 
and rarely will show you stuff that you do need to know about. Typically, we reserve these for women with breast cancer and certain types of breast cancer that mammogram doesn't do a good job on. The American Cancer Society has suggested that all women with a family history of breast cancer get yearly MRIs. I would like to see them talk to Blue Cross about that. <laughs> when to start? American Cancer Society, 35 to 40, yearly thereafter, the U.S. Public Health Service. Now, they have all sorts of recommendations. You may have heard last year they said men don't need to get PSAs anymore because, well, we don't care if men get prostate cancer. And besides, usually it's okay. It goes, you know, it doesn't kill you. And if it is going to kill you, it was going to kill you anyhow. So we aren't going to spend any money on that. The uh, their U.S. Public Health uh, people have said that age 50 without a family history, and then, then every other year. Now, there was a big fight between the Cancer Society and the U.S. Public Health, and I have to admit that I would tend to go with the Cancer Society's recommendation. We've got a 25, 30-year track record with it. It's worked fairly well. There are some cost savings by delaying. There are also some lives lost by delaying. And very much like the FDA, everybody, you know, everybody know what the FDA is, Food Drug Administration. They're the ones that approve drugs. If they approve a drug and something bad happens, they get egg on their face. If they don't approve a drug and somebody <coughs> dies because they didn't get it, they get nothing. So if we didn't do a test, we didn't look, well, it wasn't our fault because it wasn't part of the recommendation. So you can take that for what it's worth, but typically 35 to 40 for the first one year, yearly thereafter. Mammograms, the risk. They're uncomfortable for a lot of women, and I get this a lot. Well, it was invented by men. Yes, it was, to help the women they love. The radiation dose has gotten smaller and smaller each decade. Far more cancers are identified than may be caused by the radiation exposure. The thing that's the trouble with all imaging studies, all radiologic x-ray studies, is saying stuff that isn't necessarily true, saying that there's something there that's not necessarily cancer and that pushes a woman to have a biopsy. And biopsy is still the final way to say, is it good or is it bad, when the pathologist has a chance to look at the tissue under the microscope and see what's going on. Now, I suspect that most of the folks in this room have gotten a letter because the letter is mandated by the FDA, who regulates mammography. You didn't know that mammography was a drug, did you? But they, have, they mandate that every woman get a letter, and not a bad thing. There are six letters that cover anything and everything that could possibly have gone on in your breast. Now I'll bet you that in your daily life you'd like to have more than six words to describe what's going on. But this is a mandated letter from the federal government. We know how well the federal government takes criticism. The letter. What the physician sees. You typically get a letter that says everything's fine, or there may be a problem, call your doctor, or there may be a real problem, call your doctor yesterday. What we get is this. It's zero to five. Zero is, well, we don't know. We want to do some more pictures, maybe do an ultrasound, see if we can't separate the wheat from the chaff. One is pure as the wind-driven snow. I see four of these a year. I see typically 600 women a year. So it's a pretty rare fish. Two is almost pure as the wind driven snow. And that's great. You're going to get to come back in a year. 12 months, 12,000 miles. Now, three. These are the bane of my existence. Um, well, we thought we saw something. And then we had her come back, and we did some extra stuff, and we don't think we see something, or if what we see is there, we don't think it's bad. But we don't want her to go 12 months, we want her to come in six. Most of the time, in six months, nothing's there, go on about your business. But these are the ones that drive women's blood pressures up. Four is now they're getting into the area of, well, there's about a one in 10 chance that there's something going on. It could be the very earliest cancer. Could be nothing. And f for me, a lot of times it's separating out who's really gonna benefit from a, can from a biopsy. And sometimes looking back two or three years and finding out that what they're seeing today was there three years ago. 
And then if it's there for three years and it hasn't changed in that period of time, odds are that it's not a cancer, and then we can talk about whether they want to do a biopsy or not. You would think that a lot of people would, oh my gosh, i got to know right now. Two groups of women. People who cannot accept a 1% chance that something's going on, and people who tell me, make sure you call me because I'm not going to think about this again until you do. Everybody's different. Number five, cancer until proven otherwise. We don't see, fortunately, we don't see many of these. I probably see four of these a year, and that's a good thing. Now, why is it confusing? It's an x-ray. Why isn't it just a matter of just looking at the pictures and, and calling what you see? Anybody watch sports here? A couple of people? Right. Are you a replay fan? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Have you looked at a replay and go, there's no way there was pass interference? And there was pass interference. Or vice versa. It can, it's all on who's looking at what, when, and there's no uniformity to women's breasts. You know this looking around the room. And you know this if you go to Tanger. There are very few people who look exactly alike, and it makes it hard. And not to bring the lawyers into it, because both of my kids are lawyers, it's the most litigated area of radiology, of the x-ray department. Well, doctor, isn't it intuitively obvious to even the casual observer that this molecule represented this patient's early breast cancer? Well, if it did, I would have said so. But they err on the, on the side of safety. And safety sometimes means I'm not going to spend the next three weeks in court because I missed something. It's an unfortunate fact of life. What do you do when you don't get a year between trips to the vice grip? Mm -hmm. Category three, we talked a little bit about. The chance that there's something going on is very small. Doing a follow-up is reasonable, unless there are other extenuating circumstances. And I'm going to give you an example unrelated to the breast. I got called to see a young woman about three weeks ago who had terrible abdominal pain and had had terrible abdominal pain for three days. It was just like her older sister, 10 years older than she had had, earlier, several years ago, and she had very early appendicitis and they didn't do anything about it and two weeks later she had a ruptured appendix and you know, almost died and it was just a bad thing. And I'm acting exactly as my sister did. Well, what do doctors do when we don't know what to do? We order tests. Blood count was fine. She had a normal CAT scan, which is for us the gold standard, 98% accurate. She went to her doctor the next day, told him the exact same story she had told the emergency room doctors. What did he do? What do doctors do? Sing with me. Blood tests and another CAT scan. Okay? Both of which said everything's fine. Normal blood count, no fever, normal CAT scan. So I'm now invited to join the party on day three. I know a person who has had two negative CAT scans, two negative sets of blood work. So, no, 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 it wasn't broke, but it's Friday. She's now going to be left to the drift to go back to the emergency room if there's something else. And we typically have a rule, if somebody comes back three times, we do something. Well, for surgeons, we operate. So I said, I'll tell you what. I don't think you have appendicitis because the CAT scan says you don't have appendicitis. And it's 98% right, and they, they did it twice. So it's probably less than a half of a percent that you have appendicitis but you do have a little hernia on the CT. So I can justify putting you to sleep, which is by far the greatest risk for doing this operation. And I'll look at your appendix, and I'll take it out. What did the pathology report say? Very early appendicitis. I'll be darned. So you just never know. Tiny risk. Statistically, she shouldn't have had it, but she apparently did not read the statistics book. She had an appendix biopsy, we took the whole thing out, and a breast biopsy can answer the question, is there something there or not? Category four, more likely to be something, but again, still a small number, usually in the single digits. Bad things about biopsies, they can cause pain. Anytime anybody's sticking a big needle in you, that may not feel good. Bleeding is fortunately rare, but it can be impressive. I'm not talking about blood running down the leg and out the door but you can get a breast that'll sw swell up from an A cup to a C cup, which is typically not a happy time. And just doing a biopsy doesn't get you off the hook for doing follow-up mammograms. So sometimes people think, well, if I do the biopsy, I won't have to do the other stuff. No, you're gonna have to come back. Okay, now what happens when you get your biopsy? 
good news. Boy, all that stuff was there. Everything we worried about is normal tissue. You're done. Typically, you're going to get a biopsy, another mammogram in six months to be sure that everything, we're going to get an idea of what things look like. So the next time there's a change, people can say, oh, that's because she had a biopsy. Now, if your biopsy comes back cancer, well, that's time for the talk, and I'm not talking birds and bees. The frustrating one is the inconclusive. Now, sometimes a biopsy will be just a needle sample, very much like you'd get a blood sample done, and I, it's a pap smear of the breast. And if the pap smear tissue is not enough, we're going to go back and take more tissue. Sometimes you have to go to the operating room. Once you've started down the pathway of we're going to do a biopsy, we're going to go down that pathway until we can put a hand on the Bible and say that there is or is not anything going on. If it's cancer, most of the time the woman's going to be talking to a surgeon. There's been a lot that's gone on since the early 70s, and that's when my career started in 76 when I entered medicine, and I have got a chance to watch almost all of it. And you're going to get an itty-bitty tiny history lesson because all the women I have that I see for breast cancer are going to get a history lesson. Because sometimes it's like, well, we're not any better. We're still having cancer. Yes, we're still having cancer, but we're doing a little bit better with it. It's time for the woman to gather all the information that she's going to need, and that's what I consider my job and the physicians who work with me. I can see people tapping their toe in my office like, why are we talking? Why aren't we doing something? Well, the example I give is that if you need milk or stamps, I think they sell stamps at the grocery store, but I don't think they sell milk at the post office. So you've got to know what you're going for what your goal is before you start driving. And the same, that means you need to have a plan. You have to have a goal of what you would like to accomplish. And that's where the information phase begins. And although the internet's a wonderful thing, Dr. Google works day and night to answer women's questions, sometimes it needs to be narrowed down for the individual of what exactly are they looking at. And that's where the physician comes in. It's important that you bring other people there because they can ask really good questions. And I have been surprised lately. I've had a couple families where the sons actually were the better questionnaires. I don't know whether the daughters were in shock or what, or what but the son, I, you know, it's, I have to admit, sons are moderately worthless, and I can say that as a son. But <laughs> bring somebody with you. And this is the time when it's really all about you. It's not the lady who does your hair, it's not the gal you go to the checkout with, it's not the people you go to church, it's what's good for you. The one thing I like about being a surgeon is we've been involved with breast cancer since before x-rays were discovered in 1905 and before the first chemotherapy drugs were administered in 1970. And sometimes I have to remind my medical and radiology college, colleagues that they're sort of the Johnny-come-latelys. And although they're a great advance, and I'm thankful that they're there, sometimes they forget that they were not the first to the dance. I'm going to give you a real quick history now. St. Agatha in the 6th century supposedly had a spurned lover who was truly spurned and spiteful, and her breasts were cut off. In the, 19, in the 1700s, there was one case report of a woman having her breast removed. Now remember, no anesthesia. And although I take great comfort in the fact that Jesus' first miracle was changing the water and the wine, I don't think there's enough wine that would allow somebody to allow them to have their breasts cut off. Anesthesia was discovered in 1870, initially drop ether. That was in Boston. It was done by a dentist. And in the 1880s, William Stewart Halstead, who is named for the Halstead radical mastectomy, came up with his plan of how to treat breast cancer. And some folks have heard about the radical mastectomy, and it's a terrible operation and a disfiguring operation, all of which is true. But up until that time, every woman that Halstead saw died. And after his discovery or after his attempt to cure them, not all of them died. In the 1800s, breasts were not part of the physician's purview. And of course, physicians at that time were sort of trained Sort of the way Abe Lincoln was trained as a, as a lawyer at, at the side of somebody in, ahead of him. There weren't any really, very few formal medical schools. And women didn't talk about their breasts. Doctors didn't check their breasts. And typically the tumors were very large, softball size or larger. 
and the radical mastectomy, while disfiguring, was life-saving. And I have never actually performed one, and I'm glad everybody's done with lunch, but this is what is done. The breast is removed, the skin's removed, the muscle behind the breast is removed, the lymph glands are removed, and typically, women need a skin graft to close the hole. Big operation, horrible operation. You may notice this arm is bigger than this arm because they've developed lymphedema, because they took all the lymph glands out. The fact that this picture is here, though, is that she's still alive. Now, surgeons are a slow learning group, and boy, if we learn something, we stick with it. So from the 1880s until the 1950s, this was the standard of care. If a woman had a lump in her breast, she would go to the hospital the night before, stay over a sleepless night, go to the operating room having signed a consent for a biopsy and removal of her breast of cancer, and this is what she'd wake up with. And in the 1950s, a physician by the name of Pate ran, raised the question, well, do we need to do this radical operation? Tumors were getting smaller, physicians were starting to check, women were starting to report, and I want you to pay attention to the highlighted area. There was great controversy of whether we were denying people a chance for a cure. But from the 50s to the early 70s, the modified radical mastectomy became the standard. And the difference there is you don't take the skin, you don't take the muscle, essentially flat without a nipple. Much less trouble with arm swelling, but still a disfiguring operation. And that worked very well. Again, we're still in the time before there was any chemotherapy, hormone therapy, radiation therapy. Either you were cured from your cancer with surgery or you weren't. In the 1970s, people began to raise the question about whether we needed to take the whole breast. Can we just take the bad spot out? And again, pay attention to the highlighted section. There was great controversy, and I watched this through my time in medical school and residency. Great controversy. We were denying women a chance for cure. But we have 30 years of research to show that it's just as good. And now, uh, this is a patient of mine. This is her before surgery. It did in conjunction with the plastic surgery department. And this is her after surgery. And except for the tan and this one and a half inch incision, I think you'd be hard pressed to say there's really much has happened. Yet she's had all of her breasts removed, her lymph glands examined, and cancer's gone. So there has been some progress. Now, previously, all the lymph glands in the armpit were removed. We needed to know how many there were, whether there was cancer spread there, and this goes back to the second paragraph of the proposal was made that maybe we don't need to check all the lymph glands, we just need to check the ones that are intimately associated with the breast. And there was great controversy. <laughs> And in 1998, the physicians here at ARMC participated in an East Carolina study that helped validate the fact that we didn't need to take all the lymph glands. We just need to take two that are identified at the time of surgery. If they're fine, you walk away. If they're bad, typically you're going to have more lymph glands removed. But that was a big change. 70s, hormone manipulation became available with tamoxifen. First chemotherapy trials were done. Radiation therapy became available. All these nice additions to management that have made treatment better. In 1990s, you have the genetic testing becoming available, and there are two kinds of genetic testing. One is to test you and see if there is something wrong with your DNA that makes your cells misbehave. That's typically done when somebody's got a family history of my mother, my three sisters, my two aunts, and my daughter have breast cancer. That's, that's a problem from family history. And you may find that that patient has a genetic mutation that they're going to get breast cancer. They're a very tiny part of the population. The more common genetic testing we do now is to take for the women who have a known cancer, we take that we. That tissue is examined to help pre to predict what's going to come in the future. And this has been a huge plus because in the 1990s, if a woman had a pulse in her heart and breath in her body, if she had a cancer that was the size of a marble or, a, or bigger, they were going to give her fairly aggressive year-long, a year course of chemotherapy. 
genetic testing has been able to sort out the 45, 50% of women who get no benefit from that. They don't need it. All they need is their surgery and or their radiation. That's been probably the biggest advance in the last decade. The medical oncologist, great controversy about whether we were going to deny women a chance for cure by not giving them that year of chemotherapy. But the data supports that if they don't have a high score on their genetic analysis of the tumor, they get no benefit, they get risk. Coordination of care is super important. Surgeon, medical oncologist, radiation oncologist, plastic surgeon, all can be involved. Some are involved. A lot depends on the, the particular kind of breast cancer. All of these are available here. And we all play well in, together most of the time. Sometimes the medical oncologists and radiation oncologists have to be reminded that they are the Johnny come latelys. But in spite of that, we all get along pretty well. In regards to treatment, ask questions. I typically spend an hour kind of going over things and then follow up afterwards to see if all their questions are answered. And whether the woman has her breast removed or just has the bad part taken out with radiation, equally good results over time. You would think, or I would have thought, that older women would be more interested in having the breast removed, and it's exactly the opposite. Younger women are more interested in having the breast removed, and older women are more interested in saving it. So, different ways to deal with the same problem. And the last thing is really important. You need to be comfortable with where you are, who you're with, and what you're doing. If you're not, you, don't, you shouldn't be there. You need more information, you need more time, you need to think it through. Yeah.